There we are. We are live, joined by Shane Dowd, all the way in the country of Columbia, not Columbia, South Carolina. I always have to make that distinction uh, anytime I hear the word Columbia or Columbia University, being from New York City when you bring up, oh, uh, yeah, I'm going to Columbia, like the university uptown. No. Uh, but yeah, he's all the way in, in South America. And our second guest on Bono's Health here, I was uh, asking him if he happened to know the other movement guy that I know in all of South America, which, you know, it's like, hey, do you know that other person in New York City? Maybe, maybe not, but in the movement space. Uh, so previous guest, Ryan DeBell, he's all in, all the way in Argentina, but uh, really excited to have you here, Shane. How is living that uh, rustic life? It's very good. There uh, a lot of peace living in the countryside in the Andes mountain region of Colombia, and also a lot of insects. I don't know if you know this about where I live, Barichada, Colombia, but it's kind of like San Diego, California weather, which mm. means nice almost all year round, which makes the architecture of the houses here really unique in that they're open, open air houses. So it's practically like living outside, which is lovely, but it also <laughs> means there's spiders and, you know, critters that can crawl into the house much easier. So always pros and cons wherever you are, yeah. but we're happy. We're enjoying it here. Yeah, before we moved to Colorado, we were debating North Carolina or Nashville, and uh, we have driven through there before, and yeah, the bugs are just, and they eat my wife up, uh, so we're like, no no bugs, that's a, that's a deal breaker, and again, Colorado has its share of nature and bugs, but uh, not too bad so far, but yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely fun. How's the food out there? Are you living off the land, or? Uh, a little bit. We Farming. got a little tiny, tiny little garden. I wouldn't say we're living off the land, but, uh, more and more the, the neighbors and everyone around is trying to live more off the land and less off, you know, the big, big grocery stores, which there aren't any, <laughs> any big grocery stores here. So yeah, it's a lot, lot more than when I was in, living in the U S definitely a lot more local food. Um, but we're, uh, working towards growing more of our food over, over time. Yeah. It's awesome to hear. And let's get to, to who you are and all that good stuff. If folks haven't um, heard of Shane Dowd, pretty popular on the internet, it seems. Um, and, and you have the two big uh, websites or products, I guess, and that's uh, GotROM and uh, FAI Fix, right? So yeah. two of the bigger things. And we'll go a little more in depth on what each of those means. But um, your background is in, in massage therapy, uh, strength and conditioning. So was, was it CSCS? Uh, CES, corrective exercise specialist, mm -hmm. uh, part of the USA weightlifting mm. organization. I was an Olympic weightlifting coach for a long time, strength nice. conditioning coach for a long time, corrective exercise specialist, um, massage therapist, um, and flexibility teacher. So blending the worlds of like strength and athletic performance, and then like rehabilitation and flexibility and mobility. And, uh, and then now sort of especially specializing in femoral acetabular impingement or hip impingement. So all of those worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful stuff. And again, that's where, uh, you know, we saw a lot of that stuff. I saw you had your new podcast, which we'll talk about a little bit, the, the ultimate athlete as well. So, um, love to hear a little more about that. And, uh, the, let's, let's come back to, to the whole, and we talked about a little off air. And so how did you, do you find that, you know, you kind of looked at this, was there a gap in the rehab versus performance? Um, cause your story also we'll get into, I guess, is, is through dealing with your own injuries. Uh, and did you just find that there was a, a lack of being able to treat that from the traditional rehab model, which again, I'm very familiar with, and we've talked about a lot here. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not team rehab or whatever, uh, but I just want to dive into a, that whole concept of like, who owns rehab, you're dealing with pain, who should you go to, um, some guy in the internet, which is, you know, is okay if that's the case. And a lot of people get fixed from folks on the internet and, and uh, again, all credentials aside, but yeah, I want to come back to that concept of uh, what brought you to, to say other than fix, I think a lot of it from hearing your story on other podcasts is you just wanted to find a way to fix your own stuff and then share that out. So um, did you find that there was just a lack of answers or clarity in that rehab traditional space? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've met, brilliant physical therapist that if I have a question in this day and age about something, I go to them and I say, Hey, how do you think about this? What would you do about this? And so just like brilliant physical therapists. Um, and then I've read, I've met and went to and tried to seek help from a lot of, uh, physical therapists and chiropractors and healing professions in general, um, acupuncturists and 
massage therapists and ART specialists and rolfers and et cetera, et cetera. And I would say the vast majority of them, I was left with kind of like, a, hmm, well, that didn't seem like it did too much. There's, there's a handful, a small percentage of people who I think are genius at their craft. Um, but then there's a lot of people I think are just kind of going through the motions, um, unfortunately. And so that means like I would, um, so this all started when I had recurring back injuries, one of them very bad in 2015 that made me incapacitated for about a month. And my girlfriend at the time was putting on my socks and shoes. And this was super confusing to me because I'm like, I'm a well-trained strength and conditioning coach. My mentors had OCD like focus on perfect biomechanics and technique and lifting and everything. And I was recording myself lifting and doing power cleans and snatches. And like, I was doing everything right. And I still kept getting injured. So I was like, what's this about? And that led me to, you know, study massage therapy and go to a lot of physical therapy, study corrective exercise and spent like $25,000 trying to fix my own body and was left most of the time a little disappointed, a little let down because what, what I often got, and this isn't to, to, to classify a profession as all this, because I know that there's people like you who are um, not doing it this way, but a lot of my experiences where I go into the physical therapist, they do a very quick eval of my history about what's, what's gone wrong with my body. Um, maybe like tug on my leg a little bit, do some gentle, like passive manipulations where they're moving my hip around, put me on a stim machine, put some heat on it. Uh, give me like two stretches and then send me home with maybe two or three exercises to do at home. So it's like my experience with them is like 15 minutes and then, and it's mostly passive and it's not training me about what I can do on myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, and then the homework that they give me is very simple and very generic. Mm -hmm. Um, even, even though I'm saying like, look, I'm an extremely committed individual. Like I will do what it takes to come out of this problem. Right. And I also have a lot of compassion that a lot of the average physical therapist might be dealing with a lot of, um, patients not being compliant with the homework that they do give them. And so they're like, well, geez, okay, I'm just going to give you like the basics because I know that 80% of my, my patients might not even um, do their homework. And so they just say, please just do this minimum. So I also get that there's a difficult, a difficulty on the, on the physical therapist side. But um, I noticed that what I personally needed was someone who was going to spend way, way more time with me mm -hmm. and give me a much deeper, more profound, uh, experience where they were seeing how all of my old injuries were kind of interrelated and they were trying to get to the root causes of things, not just the surface level symptoms of things. So I was left with kind of like, uh, 80% of the massage therapists and physical therapists and chiropractors and acupuncturists and things that I tried were kind of like, mm, I didn't learn much from that. I could take a little bit from everything. Um, but then there was like the 10 to 20% where I was like, Ooh, there's some real gold in here. And I'm going to mm -hmm. use that to just heal my own problems. And, um, this is also when I found like Kelly star at mobility wad and he seemed to be doing, I'm actually recording a podcast with him in like three hours. Just <laughs> fun. Awesome. Fun fact. Awesome. Yeah. Say hi to him for me. I, I bet I I'm in San Francisco one time big influence on my life, big influence on the way I viewed like, um, healing the body mm -hmm. and probably the, the origins of what my system is these days, which I call the TSR system, which is tissue work, stretching and reeducation came from his smash stretch and improve your motor control. Well, kind yeah, of overarching let, philosophy. Let's jump to that and, and go a little into that. That was one of the main things you wanted to, to discuss. So, uh, go into those three principles of the TSR system, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so like I said, it's basically tissue work, stretching and reeducation, which any physical therapist will recognize like, okay, some degree of body work. This looks like rolfing. This looks like trigger point therapy, ART, active release therapy, different healers and therapists use them in different quantities. But, um, I found that really deep targeted pinpoint precision massage using various tools or with the hands of a skilled manual therapist was a big part in sort of like relieving pain and giving me like a, a window of opportunity to start to move more and be comfortable again. It also made stretching the step two in the TSR system feel a lot more comfortable. I used to go to yoga classes and do like the resting poses, poses like child pose, child's pose or downward dog, and they would hurt me. And it wasn't until I started to chew up those muscles, like you chew up bubble gum and then it stretches better. Um, it wasn't until I started chewing up my muscles a little bit in very targeted ways 
um, prior to stretching, that stretching became more effective. And then the strengthening and stability and motor control training um, is the third step. It's sort of like using that new range of motion that you just unlocked, learning how to be in a better biomechanical position. And, um, and so now that I work with people, a lot of people in different areas, but especially people who are dealing with FAI hip impingement, they often report to me, I say, okay, you've tried this physical therapy, have you tried that treatment? What about that didn't work? And what about the TSR system is is helping you more? And they often say that one of those three pillars was missing. Maybe the physical therapist was only having them strengthen things. It's clamshells and group glute bridges and core training until you're blue in the face and that should solve everything. Or if it's a shoulder issue, it's rotator cuff strengthening and that's going to solve everything. Um, or there's other people that are heavily tissue work bias and they think a good deep massage is going to solve everything, but they don't teach you how to move better. They don't teach you anything about stability and motor control. Um, or there's people that don't include any flexibility training whatsoever in their, in their routine. And they're not able to get in. I remember Kelly Starrett saying this, he said, if you can't get into a safe biomechanical position, what's your plan to get there? And if it's just squat more or deadlift more, and you're just going to all of a sudden get into a better position. Um, that's not going to work for everybody. Maybe some people they'll just start to groove a better and better pattern and they'll get a deeper and deeper squat over time. But other people like me who have a specific issue going on and notice that their right hip with the FAI and the labral tear and the, and the cam impingement and the subchondral cysts, uh, gets hyper tight a lot quicker than your other hip. And therefore you need something to relax it more than just squat more that wasn't working for me so those are the three steps of the tsr system awesome love it and yeah you mentioned something in there um and i like that i forget who to attribute this quote to on the bottom here motion is gained in the range it is trained so yeah when i do needles on someone dry needling versus acupuncture or some kind of body work and we can get a little bit extra 10 degrees of shoulder range of motion um that's the time that we have to really hone in and train that range so that the brain gets comfortable there. I definitely agree with that concept. And I think that gets missed very, very often. <laughs> and, and a lot of times the people that come to me are the ones who have felt those results temporarily and not had long-term results because of that, because the root cause is never getting addressed. And yeah, to your point also, um, as you were talking about earlier, that's, yeah, for me, the way I work and the reason I moved away from the insurance model uh, where you might need to see people 15 minutes at a time and kind of go, go, go and hope that, yeah, you're doing as as good as you can. Um, yeah, I do at least a 90 minute assessment on on folks so we can put all the pieces together and do as many different assessment pieces. Again, if it was up to me, I'd actually be doing closer to three hour assessments. I just don't think most humans are going to sign up for that. It's a little too extreme from from the norm right now. But 90 minute assessments seem to be pretty good for uh, what, what I kind of work with and get people to buy into these concepts. So I definitely want to emphasize that everything you just brought up is, is phenomenal. I love it. And I'm sorry, you had to go through it to, to learn that. And that's the other thing too, for me is a lot of times people come to me after failing with nine, 10 other clinicians, because I'm not a traditional physical therapist. Um, so yeah, I love, I love being able to have these conversations and hear these stories around that. Um, you mentioned the FAI, the hip impingement, love to dive into a little bit more of that. And, uh, I don't know if you want to, um, you know, talk a little about your system that you have online or again, your own experience with it and, and how, which things, and if it's just a, you know, kind of designing your own TSR system <laughs> to, to kind of, uh, MacGyver it, I guess, with paper clips and, and, uh, you know, foam rollers and things like that. And I saw you using the, uh, the, the stick, the, the rolly stick, uh, in some of your recent posts on Instagram. So, uh, yeah, we're, let's let's switch over to that FAI concept for anyone not familiar, just hip impingement where a lot of people, again, I find um, have issues and pain with the way that their hips function and it, they don't feel it for a long time, uh, unfortunately, and they're very active and then maybe they're jumping, they're running, they're doing all these things and the hip is just constantly kind of pinching and grow. It, it ends up growing bone either on the ball or the socket um, and then what ends up happening a lot of times for those folks is they have to have a little shaving down of either of those. And again, they never really address the issue, the underlying cause and change the movement pattern. Um, so we'll see, you know, problems down the line with that as well. And again, a lot of total hip replacements that I can certainly talk about for a while, but I'm going to throw it back over to you. I don't want to dominate that piece because I love treating the hip as well. Cause I do find so many people have an impingement of sorts and then we can get down to is it how structural is it how much of that bony growth has already happened 
versus how much of it is kind of tightness and movement pathology where your brain's kind of like, I don't really like going into that. So that's where I love to, to assess people and get them uh, doing some of these kind of correctives uh, way ahead of developing issues. So, but yeah, I'd love to hear a little about, uh, again, we're talking about true pathology and having cysts and, <laughs> and, and needing possibly, or getting told you probably need surgery. Um, and I'll let you take it from there. Yeah. Well, I, I think that this, the, there's the traditional story of hip impingement, which is kind of like the, it's, it's the traditional story that, um, surgeons and, and modern medicine often tells at first, which is like, there's some structural problem and the only way to fix it is surgery. So you got back pain. It's, it's definitely a bulging disc and you need back surgery. You have knee pain. It's because you've worn down your cartilage. You need knee surgery. And from what I've seen over time, it doesn't prove to be quite so black or white. It's not just like bad bones equals need surgery. Often it's like bad bones might need surgery for some people, but before you go there, you should try physical therapy. You should try some different types of strength training, massaging, stretching things, seeing what you can do non-surgically to see if you can make it go all the way away where it's not an issue anymore. Also, you know, lifestyle and activity modifications, modifying the way that you're playing your sport, modifying the way that you're squatting, modify, modifying the way that you're doing things. Oftentimes with some mobility work, some motor control training with a good skilled physical therapist, um, changing of activity and lifestyle, you can get to zero pain or movement problems and you feel great and you don't need to um, go through an expensive, possibly riskier surgery, depending on what you're doing surgery on. And so, um, when I was coming out of my own FAI hip problems in like 2015, I always thought in the back of my mind, like, I'm not anti-surgery. Like if, if I start, if my pain start, if, if I start trending in a bad direction, I'll consider surgery. If my pain starts to get worse and worse and worse, I'll consider surgery. If I start moving worse and worse and worse, I'll consider surgery because that's what the doctors were recommending that I do. They said, look at your x-ray, look at your MRI. You've got cam impingement. You've got a labral tear. You've got a cyst. This is what happens. This inevitably leads to arthritis and this inevitably leads to total hip replacement. That's like the progression down the road. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that may be the case. Um, but first let me try some of this mobility wad stuff. Let me try some of this stuff that, um, my, my chiropractor who was a deep tissue therapist, he, he was a chiropractor, uh, traditionally trained, but he just started doing this really deep targeted tissue work on people that was like even more precise and pinpoint than what I saw um, Kelly Starrett talking about on Mobility Wad. Kelly Starrett was talking about using kettlebells and barbells and foam rollers and all these different tools to smash yourself, basically. And this chiropractor that I met in Encinitas, California named Phil was using these like pinpoint like stone tools and he would mm -hmm. lay me on my side and like work on my hip rotators and my adductors and like way, way deep trigger point style therapy. And, um, when I started doing all that and exploring stretching and learning how to move better, better motor control, noticing subtler and subtler compensation patterns, working with skilled physical therapists who were pointing out my subtle, subtle compensation patterns, all of that added up or aggregated, you know, like you say, like 1% a day, 1% mm -hmm. at a time. And over the span of a couple months, then a couple years, things kept getting better and better. And so I ultimately didn't get surgery for my hip impingement. And that was now like 10, 12 years ago. And I can run, I can play sports. I'm playing Frisbee. I'm cutting, I'm doing trail running. I'm doing plyometrics. I'm doing Olympic weightlifting. I'm swimming, I'm hiking, you know, 12 hours at a time. Like I have no pain and no movement problems. And I'm not saying that everyone with hip impingement is going to be exactly like me because I had a lot of factors going for me. I did have a background in kinesiology and anatomy and, and I could afford to, uh, invest in coaches and therapists and educate myself. And I had a mindfulness practice. So I was more in tune with my body and da, 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 da. there was advantages that I had. And I recognized that not everyone's going to have that, but I think it's important to note that bad bones don't equal everyone needs surgery it's a spectrum and there's going to be a, a, a wide variety of people that may or may not need surgery in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just to add on that, um, recent trends, hopefully in, in the positive there, even something like degenerative disc disease, which sounds scary. 
uh, a lot of the kind of national and international organizations are saying we should stop using those terms because they're scary terms. And the reality of it is it's like saying, hey, you have wrinkles under your eye there. Like, and oh, the camera's always backwards if you haven't caught on to that. Um, it still throws me off after 100 something episodes. Um, but yeah, saying degenerative disc disease is something that, again, it's it's common. It's a normal part of aging. It doesn't mean you should have pain. Um, and there's a big difference. I always try to distinguish between normal and common as well. Uh, so things are very common. A lot of people deal with the same stuff. I'm, you know, almost 40 now. And a lot of my cohort are all like, oh, my back hurts. I wake up. I'm having all these aches and pains. And, and it's like everyone thinks that that's just to be expected, where the reality of it is, is like, no, we can do things. I feel great. Like, you know, a lot of the same stuff you're saying, I try to uh, have that background. And I've spent half a million dollars in education on <laughs> getting a doctorate. You know, I did a USAW as well. I did a lot of the same kind of things, all this overlap we have. So um, it's kind of incredible when you look at it, but that a lot of that is selfishly so I can feel better and then share those things that I've, I've found as well. So yeah, it's funny how uh, our stories kind of do parallel in some ways, but yeah, the other interesting, uh, statistical thing there in the research is you can take a hundred people on the street and they've done this in research, do MRIs out of a hundred people with no symptoms, no pain and 72 of them, especially in more in this middle age range, will have disc herniations where surgeons will say, not knowing anything else, like we should cut that guy open. We should, you know, fix that disc bulge or disc herniation. And the reality is they don't have any symptoms that affect their lives. There's people with bone on bone arthritis of their knees, of their hips, that they just figure out how to deal with it and live with it. Is a surgery going to fix them? Maybe, maybe not. But at the end of the day, yeah, I'm with you. Um, I'm not against surgery. I think it can help a lot of people, but I do think a lot of times we go too quickly to that. And the term you use of why don't we try physical therapy First, uh, again, if, if trying physical therapy, as you also alluded to, is just go ahead, meet with someone 15 minutes, do all the clamshells and banded, you know, things and have this small kind of little attempt at taking like a Tylenol to address this bigger underlying cause or issue, um, it's probably not going to work too often. Um, and again, I can't tell you how many people I try to get to before they have the surgery. Our dog sitter when we moved here to Colorado, 10 years of neck pain, chronic neck pain. Uh, hypermobile, uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and uh, ready to have the surgery finally after 10 years of trying, again, everything, quote unquote. Uh, I told her to come in and see me before you go do the surgery. I have the handheld dynamometer so I can see, you know, at least we can look at myotome patterns and how strong you are right now so that after the surgery, we can at least get you back to this baseline um, and make sure your, you know, your C4 movement pattern can create X amount of kilograms of force and all this good stuff. So I started doing that and, and just long story short there, and I've, I've posted a few videos about her story of the fact that no one had ever taught her. And even though she tried physical therapy and Reiki and, and all these other things, uh, how to actually activate the muscles of her neck. And the next day she called me up. She's like, I'm sore in my neck, like my muscles, I can feel my muscles. What is this? So she was actually able to, at that point, as she was a month out from surgery, she went to the surgeon and, and they wanted to do like seven levels of fusion on her. Um, and again, a lot of people will just go and do this because, because they trust the doctor and she actually got multiple surgical opinions and everything. So yeah, long story short, sorry, it was pretty long, but <laughs> she ended up only, uh, he agreed to only do one level for now and tell her, told her to keep doing some of the next strengthening stuff that apparently no one had ever exposed her to, which is just, <laughs> again, this is the kind of stuff that baffles my mind and why I want to, you know, get, get out, have these conversations with folks of like, you were able to avoid having a hip surgery by kind of putting all these pieces together, which is awesome. So um, I don't know if you want to add anything else on the FAI type stuff. I know there's a lot there. <laughs> yeah, no, well, you brought up something that I feel kind of um, passionate about, which is like, I'll hear a lot of people that'll come to me and say, hey, I've got FAI. I tried physical therapy. Tried physical I tried therapy. stretching. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I want to talk about is I tried physical therapy. And so if I investigate that a little bit, they'll say, you know, I tried eight weeks and I asked them, what did they do? And it was often mm -hmm. like foam roll my quads, do glute bridges and stretch mm -hmm. my hip flexors yeah. and, and, and maybe a stim <laughs> or something. And they did right. that for eight weeks. And I'm like, you have not maxed out no. physical therapy. And, and, no. and so I say, you have to <laughs> max out good physical therapy. And let me right. introduce you to some good physical therapists mm -hmm. that you can go see in person, because even though we have the FAI fix, which is our best do it yourself, sort of take a crack at. Mm -hmm. fixing your own hip impingement there's nothing like skilled hands-on work from a skilled physical therapist and so i'll say go to this person or that person um and see them for 
you know, eight, 12 or more right. weeks. And then tell me if you, if you think <laughs> that you've maxed out physical therapy at all, yeah. because I, t I promise you it's not foam rolling and hip flexor stretching. It's right. much deeper than that. The, the joke we have in our little circles of, uh, you know, frustrated physical therapists is when we hear that, it's like someone saying, I tried McDonald's and it was not great. And I'm just not going to go to restaurants anymore. I tried all the restaurants because I tried McDonald's. It's like, I don't, I'm, I consider myself, you know, like a three, maybe two star Michelin restaurant. Like I, I consider myself pretty, pretty fancy and I'm going to give you that extra level of service and everything. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a little frustrating to hear. And again, we can't blame the consumer uh, at the end of the day. It's not, you know, it's the system that we're in and every system, another great quote. Uh, I, I appreciate that we're throwing some quotes back and forth at each other here from a book called Upstream is that every system is, is perfectly designed to get the result it gets. And so, you know, this is the healthcare system. This is the insurance-based system, especially here in America. Um, I, you know, I don't know if you've even played in the, the uh, healthcare space in South America, but if, if there's any differences there. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it's pretty frustrating. And uh, I just retweeted someone yesterday uh, that showed that our life expectancy in the United States is continuing to go down as our health expenditure just continues to skyrocket. And, and it's, it's, it's just, it's scary stuff. And we're just spending money on a lot of the wrong stuff. And uh, yeah, uh, that'll get me going down a whole nother <laughs> path. But again, we're trying to get to the folks who are willing to listen, ready to listen and willing to invest. And, in, uh, you know, the term I use, and we're talking about the ultimate athlete, it's kind of our third uh, bullet point here for the podcast of, I, I've called myself a physical retirement specialist. So, you know, there's financial planners who help you save money for retirement, understand how to use 401ks for compounding interest and all these things. Um, I think of the same, I do the same for folks 30 years from now. I want you to be healthier than you are today for a lot of folks um, and, and how to get the most out of your joints, how to get the most out of your spine and what can we do in behaviors. Um, and that's going to get you the most return on investment again, 30 years from now. Uh, so, and it sounds like you kind of have that similar longevity piece. You're talking about the ultimate athlete, high performing and long lasting. So uh, is it possible to have both? <laughs> Totally. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of, uh, that's why they have the senior Olympics because there's still people that are, can physically move pretty impressively at an older age. And it's one of my lifelong, lifelong aspirations to compete in those senior Olympics, because for whatever reason, even in my twenties, I found it, it's like one of the first videos that I put on YouTube in my twenties was talking about my lifelong dream of competing in the senior Olympics. And for hmm. whatever reason, just the, I, I'm much more, I don't know, longevity, and, and performing at a high level for a long period of time, like that consistency, I find right. cooler than, you know, <clears throat> I broke a world record in powerlifting in my twenties and then I got overweight and just, you know, mm -hmm. had, had heart disease for the rest of my life or whatever. Like I'm much more interested in well-roundedness and I'm much more interested in perf good performance over a long period of time. So it's like, it's like, um, if my goal for myself is to be what I, what I consider in my mind is the ultimate athlete. It's someone who, uh, is a little bit good at everything. He's pretty flexible. Like I can do the splits, but I also can sprint and run and cut and I'm approaching 40 myself and I'm playing ultimate Frisbee here in Columbia with 19 and 20 year olds and still competing athletically at their level even though I'm approaching 40, not because I've been a stud athlete my entire life, but I've been extremely consistent with good health habits and strength training for many, many years and flexibility and mobility training to go along with that strength training. So that's kind of what I think of when I think of the, the ultimate athlete, it's like ultimate in the sense of like well-rounded high performing, but also like, um, like, you know, the greats of all time, the Tom Brady's that are like, good over long, long periods of time. They don't just, they're not just a flash in the pan. They aren't just a bright star that burns out after one season. It's like, they've got longevity to go along with high, high skill. And so I just started the ultimate athlete podcast, kind of viewing a lot of interesting people on interviewing a lot of interesting people on that. One of them that I just talked to is uh, the school of calisthenics and they have, um, mm -hmm. I just listened kind to of, that, uh, episode yesterday. Yeah, exactly. They've got, uh, they talk about your physical and pension, investing in your physical pension. So it's like, these are the kind of people that I like having a conversation with people that all resonate with the idea of like, I want to be an athlete for life. Like I want to be that grandpa out on the track doing a skips and B skips and sprinting <laughs> and doing plyometrics. And oh my God, grandpa's now in the gym doing a snatch in a full depth overweight, uh, you know, overhead squat. And then he's like getting into splits like positions, maybe not the full splits at 90, but you know, he's still, he's doing all of that. He's like the ultimate athlete at 90. And so 
that's what I'm exploring now in conversation with other people and to see what I can learn and what we can share. Yeah. I mean, you know, my, I have, I have a pretty strong background in the CrossFit space and I don't know how you feel about the overall concept of CrossFit, if it's gotten bastardized over the years from its original message and things like that. I do think there's some of that. Um, I did, uh, I my other podcast, the man better podcast with a co-host is a personal trainer in New York city who hates CrossFit. Um, <laughs> And uh, see, sees a lot of folks who, you know, end up, again, getting getting broken through CrossFit and going to him looking for a better solution, um, which, again, happens similar to, to the, some of these models we're talking about. Um, so it does sound like in your definition, though, there is a lot of overlap with that kind of CrossFit definition of fitness, work capacity, if you will. Um, you know, again, play, being able to learn and play new sports. So I don't know. I just my, my question is. Is, do you have a clear definition of fitness? Again, I'm sure you've uh, known a lot of Kelly Starrett stuff as well. Uh, you played a little bit in that, that at least CrossFit definition. Doesn't sound like, you know, you haven't brought it up. I don't know if, you know, I'm, I'm actually curious even how Kelly later today, <laughs> how, how he's feeling about the whole concept of CrossFit, how it's evolved and or devolved. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to hear any takes you have on, on that concept and what, you know, what good, what bad is there and, and you know, just your take on that. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I worked in a CrossFit gym for quite a few years as an Olympic lifting coach. And then as, as their sort of Olympic lifting coach slash strength coach slash flexibility and mobility teacher. And, um, and I got to see kind of see it done really well and then see it done not so well. And I think that I agree with a lot of the sort of core principles of the philosophy. I like the idea of just being good at everything, being well-rounded, not just being, I like that, you know, before CrossFit, it was, it was, it felt the whole fitness industry felt very siloed to me. It was like, there was the bodybuilders that did the bodybuilding thing and the powerlifters did their powerlifting thing and Olympic lifters and sprinters and gymnasts, and they all did separate things. And CrossFit sort of brought that all together in one big soup, one big, big hodgepodge. And, um, I think that for the average person who just wants to be a well-rounded athlete, like strong, lean, flexible, fast, good endurance, like all the biomotor abilities, they're pretty good at all of them. Um, depending on the CrossFit gym that you go to, it can be good or bad. Just like you go to a good physical therapist, you can go to a bad physical therapist, mm -hmm. good personal trainer, bad personal trainer. There's So getting into the weeds about is it good or bad based on this gym or that gym is a, a losing game because some yeah. of them will be brilliant programming based on really great coaches and other of them will be complete chaos where, you know, someone walks in with all kinds of orthopedic issues and no mobility and they're maxing out their squat and their snatch in the first or second weeks. And it's just <laughs> like ludicrous. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I like the general principles of like trying to develop multiple biomotor abilities. And I like the, I like the community atmosphere and sort of like the sense of community that they, that they introduced to the gym culture, which used to just be, I go there, I do chest back and buys and I leave and I don't talk to anyone. Hmm. And it became much more about community. And I think that was really healthy and, um, and motivating and, you know, just getting people to do some kind of fitness activities, uh, even if they're not picture perfect is often a good thing. So I'm not going to like poo poo on CrossFit. I'm not going to say it's, it's implemented in so many different ways. It's like saying, how do you feel about sports? Right. Well, there's so many sports and there's so many people doing sports so many, in so many different ways. Right. So I agree with the court. It's a lot of the fundamental principles. Right. It's, 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 uh, carried out in bad ways in different places. <laughs> yeah. I think that was more of uh, my yeah. question. Uh, just to be clear is, is not as much about the implementation. I mean, that's an interesting, uh, very big can of worms that we can certainly go down, but I meant more in, in, in how the definition aligns because the way you were speaking certainly seems to overlap that whole concept of, yeah, get good at, gym, you know, controlling your own body in space, uh, gymnastics, right? Get good at controlling an external object, all the lifting, powerlifting, kettlebell, sport, all that stuff. And then uh, you haven't talked, I mean, talk a little bit about the cardio piece, but that's kind of the basic thing, right? We have these three ways we can simplify health, wellness, fitness, longevity. Um, so being able to control your own body, having good joint health is another part of that. Um, being able to control an external object and then having that again, cardio respiratory ability to bring oxygen in, push oxygen out. Theoretically, if we get good at these three concepts, then we have a longer, better athletic, high performing, all these things. And just understanding how to push all that 
uh, little by little, that's the strength and conditioning piece. That's the art of programming. Uh, you go into super training, Mel Sif, whatever you want to <laughs> go into, like you're saying, but putting some of these systems together. And it's also been fun seeing how CrossFit as a sport has evolved and again, changing some of the ways that we think about strength and conditioning of, you know, I've heard some of the top CrossFit coaches working with some of the top CrossFit athletes being like, I didn't think anybody could do, you know, whatever thrusters for at 200 pounds, five reps on the minute. Like you should have, you shouldn't have been able to go past 10 minutes. And the athlete was like, Hey, I'm at minute 25. Should I just keep going? Like, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, I just can do it. So yeah, just rewriting and understanding uh, the ch changing what our bodies are kind of capable of. So it is kind of cool to see. Um, and it is kind of cool to see, yeah, how you can take some of the bad, push the bad aside and hopefully, um, start seeing folks 40, 50 years from now, who knows how some of these athletes who did CrossFit intentionally from being a teenager and they have this, the teenage categories of, of the CrossFit games and all this kind of stuff. Um, and how that's going to translate over the next 50, 60, 70 years, um, where maybe we're going to see that hundred year old athlete who, <laughs> like you're talking about the senior Olympics, uh, who can really do all sorts of crazy stuff that, you know, 50 year olds couldn't do today. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see, especially with the way aging is going. I, it's definitely an area that's super interesting to me. Uh, but yeah, trying to, trying to bring it a little bit back to the ultimate athlete is, yeah. Do you have, uh, specific, uh, systems in place, kind of FMS, SFMA, all these different letters. Uh, is there stuff from CES, uh, the corrective exercise specialist that you kind of want to see progress? So that was one of the reasons I went down the CrossFit path. Cause again, there's ways we can measure your fitness through some of those systems. It's something I've been working to develop. I know again, uh, we keep bringing up Kelly Starrett, uh, since I'm having him on later, but he has this kind of virtual mobility coaching system where, he talks about shapes and can you get into shapes? And if you can't own that position, like the bottom of a squat that we're talking about and breathe there also, um, those are places that you might be cheating and you might be causing some more damage if you're building this movement practice. So yeah, I guess my question is, do you have uh, a system you're willing to share? Is that specifically on kind of the, you know, if you're going down the FAI path, if you're going into the, the got ROM system, uh, is, is that kind of where your systems are? Yeah. I always, when I, <clears throat> When I think about that, I always have the average guy or gal in mind. So the system can't, it's got to be something that you can kind of do on your own that you can sort of measure relatively easy without a, a physical therapy background, without a mm -hmm. kinesiology biomechanics background. And so I do like sort of the basic shapes model of like, can you get your arms overhead like that? Or can you hang from a bar? and have your, your, your arm be like past your ear or in line with your ear. Do you have that kind of shoulder flexion? Can you do a full range of motion dip or push up without, you know, your shoulder translating forward to an extreme degree degree? Can you get into a basic full squat shape? Can you get into a flat back, you know, parallel to the ground deadlift shape, a lunge shape? Like that's, I like that model for the average guy or gal because it's easy to see. I mean, there's subtle ways that you can compensate around each one of those positions that you might not know if you don't have a keen eye. But if you just, you know, reach out to someone like yourself or myself or Kelly Starrett or anyone else who's got a keen eye who's been in the game for a while, then they'll be able to say, oh, you, you thought you were in, you know, uh, a full squat, but you actually did it with an extreme amount of lumbar flexion that could be related to your hips. It could be related to your ankles. It could be related to your bracing strategy. Let's work on all that and see if we can get you into a, a better squat shape or a better overhead shape where you're not arching your back to get into that shape or, or whatever the different compensations may be. So, um, those shapes, um, are, are really nice. Um, if you want to get a little bit more specific, you can do some of the typical sort of orthopedic tests because I talk to a lot of people that are dealing with hip issues, then there's, you know, your typical hip tests of flexion, extension, internal, external rotation, obers, fabers, like those kind of orthopedic tests that you would probably need to see someone to have them, you know, check you out with that. I mean, you can do them on your own or with like your spouse or whatever, but again, there's so many ways that, you know, they're not checking your hip rotation in the same yeah. position <laughs> and et cetera, et cetera. So that's a little can bit I of risky territory. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I agree with you on that. Um, I do have a virtual um, assessment I certainly share with with folks that includes a, a good amount of hip stuff because I do find that tends to be an area of problems for most folks dealing with some back pain where, and that's another whole conversation of, you know, again, like you mentioned, you started with back pain. That really was hip pain, right? I think was was the, yeah. the ultimate thing. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of confusion there, again, in the healthcare space because uh, even the way I have, I had a patient uh, just today who, you know, she wants to get a MRI on her lumbar spine. And I'm like, I 
think it's more your hip um, based on everything that's presenting. So I wanted to ask you, though, in your experience with however many, you know, at this point, hundreds, thousands of athletes <laughs> that have come across your your desk, so to speak, is um, that a lot of folks hopefully listening, if they're interested, is, is they might be more uh, attuned to is tight hamstrings versus tight hip flexors or weak hip flexors. How do you how do you address that? That's an area I'd love to geek out on a little bit, um, you know, since we're, we're going down some of these rabbit holes of how does that connect with what you're finding, what you're assessing? Because um, I just find most people think they have tight hamstrings. The reality of it is they don't, um, especially when I can get them on my table and show them some of the different movement patterns. Uh, and then again, a lot of people get told they have tight hip flexors from possibly well-meaning, again, chiropractors, physical therapists, that kind of thing. And then I do a basic Thomas test since we're talking about some, uh, you know, fancier terms here. And, and that, that should tell us if you have short or long hip flexors. And a lot of times, again, clinically, it doesn't present as that. So sometimes it's just weak hip flexors. But yeah, uh, then we're talking about deconditioned and, and maybe movement pattern wise. So yeah, sorry, uh, got me geeking out on all this, but I'd love to hear <laughs> hamstrings hip flexors, balancing. Again, we could talk quad hamstring ratios and all this stuff. But uh, again, I'm just going to throw that at you and see where <laughs> what that triggered for you. Yeah. I mean, again, it's kind of a different game depending on the person that's in front of me. If they have access to like uh, a skilled physical therapist that can help them geek out a little bit more about this, then I would, you know, have them say, okay, maybe, maybe not do you have short hamstrings? Maybe you just don't know how to brace. And when you do brace, like you might think I have tight hamstrings because when I go to deadlift, I can't get down into a good deadlift shape. And my back always rounds tight hamstrings. That's the, that's the culprit. Uh, but then like, you know, you demonstrate to them, if you organize yourself and get braced, then all of a sudden you have more hamstring range of motion. Or if you can pull yourself down into that position using your hip flexors, um, you know, maybe it's a lack of strength on the other side of the joint. That's why it's popular to say in this day and age, don't wish you had more flexible hamstrings, wish you had stronger quads, which is just pointing to the fact that, you know, it's, it's a give and take. There's two sides to the joint. You can strengthen, you know, the agonist side, or you can stretch the antagonist side. I could strength, I could stretch my ham, my hamstrings, or I could strengthen my hip flexors. I say in general, in any well-rounded sort of flexibility, mobility program, if that is in fact what you need, uh, do a little bit of both, you know, lengthen if you need to lengthen, but also strengthen and just make sure there's no obvious discrepancy between those two. So, um, if someone is technically savvy enough to follow the conversation that I'm that I'm talking about with them, then I'll go there. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, um, if someone's just uh, doing it, doing all of this their own, um, and they just want to sort of like hit a little bit of everything so that they know that they're going to be fairly healthy, then in any sort of flexibility mobility program that I give them, say from my website, Got Rom, um, there will always be a mixture of both lengthening and strengthening. And if you're, if you're talking to all of those things, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm testing my hip flexor strength and I'm testing my hamstring flexibility, and I find that I just feel super weak in my, in my hip flexors, then maybe I know I need to spend a little bit more time on that. Um, so yeah, just having people not just focusing on always stretching, stretching if something feels tight, but also strengthening the other side of the joint is a, is a pretty good starting point for the average guy or gal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing a little bit of uh, pike lifts right now for my quad. <laughs> just reminding me. And yeah. Never, never, never super fun, no matter how you, how many times you do it. Um, no. But <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that, that perspective and uh, sharing all, a lot of your perspectives here. Um, I want to be respectful of your time and, and we can start to wrap it up a little bit, but if there's any other major big uh, things you want to share or you want to just go into, uh, you know, where folks can find you, I'll have a lot of the links in the show notes, but uh, feel free to, to give us closing thoughts, if you will. Sure. I, th I think one th sort of theme that you touched on in the very beginning of this conversation that I think is important is how do the worlds of training, which is like the personal trainers and the strength coaches blend with the world of rehab and physical therapy. And I don't know if you're familiar with Charlie Weingroff. Is it I, Weingroff? I, I worked for him and um, I, I got some legal stories I can tell you there, but yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, he's got, he's got a quote, which is training equals rehab, rehab, rehab equals training, yep. which, um, which means that in an ideal world, 
those worlds overlap a lot or mm-hmm. they should overlap a lot in, in a perfect scenario where there's like an athlete who's training, but then he gets injured rather than sending him to be babied at physical therapy, which sometimes happens. Like, you know, he's this hard training athlete, sprinting, lifting heavy weights, hardcore training, and then he gets injured and he goes away to physical therapy and, uh, and he does just like clamshells and group glute bridges for, you know, eight weeks and then jumps right back into training. That's not ideal. So how do we right. blend these two worlds? And, um, I tried to do that with the FAI fix program for hip impingement because I found that that was my experience. It's like, I came from classical strength and conditioning, sprinting, Olympic lifting. Um, and then the world of physical therapy was just giving me foam rolling and hip flexor stretching. (laughs) Yeah. Real quick. One thing I tell folks is if they don't have a squat rack in the physical therapy facility, run probably need to go. (laughs) Yeah. You need to go somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and so how I personally tried to sort of help bridge that gap a little bit is I was saying, well, if someone say, for example, has FAI, their options are go to physical therapy and hope that they land on someone who's really skilled like yourself, who's going to spend the time with them, educate them, not just give them three stretches. Um, but if they can't find that person or they don't have the means to work with that person for some reason, because some people just economically can't. Um, their other option is the internet. And Mm -hmm. so they're going to, almost everyone's going to Google their condition and they're going to go to YouTube and they're either going to find something which is reasonably backed and well thought out from someone who actually has suffered through the issue and has kinesiology background and has studied it and lived through it, or they're going to find a smattering of random YouTube videos that they have to piece (laughs) together. And so if they're left with those options, I was like, well, I'm going to make it crystal clear that I'm not saying I'm a physical therapist. I'm not saying I'm diagnosing your condition and I'm not saying I'm going to solve your condition. That's why we have a money back guarantee. Whereas if you try out these exercises and you do the self tests and you do it mindfully and you can ask us for support at any time, we'll respond to your emails and you find that it's not getting you where you needed to be. Uh, you get all your money back. And so it's, it's at least better than just random YouTube videos and random Google searches. And we say all over the place, like, uh, you should do this ideally hand in hand with a physical therapist because they can move your body. They can, they can touch, you know, this part, you need to activate this more. You need to relax this and move you around. So the ideal scenario would be like, um, they're doing a lot on their own and they know that they can't just run to the physical therapist. Who's going to wave a magic wand and fix them. Um, nor can they just, uh, do nothing and just expect it to go away. So, um, I was trying to fill that gap a little bit with the FAI fix where it's like, it's better than random YouTube searches. It's based on people who have a background in this stuff. It's based on people who actually live through hip impingement. Um, and it doesn't replace physical therapy. So I think that's an important point to make for people that may be listening to us and, and wondering what they should do. Yeah, it's definitely a crazy time. It's an amazing time, but, uh, sometimes too much information problematic too. Uh, and there's a lot of, a lot of people selling a lot of stuff out there, a lot of snake oil that, uh, yeah, uh, that's again, the, the other podcast I have demand better. We consider it a consumer's guide, uh, for, for folks. And yeah, if you're not getting your stuff answered and if it feels a little cookie cutter, then, then that's problematic. Right. So, uh, definitely one of the big things we talk about our first two episodes there were demanding better from personal trainers and then demanding better from physical therapists. Um, and so, yeah, we're trying to really continue to, to kind of expose some of the things that bother us that we see in the industry. Um, and yeah, so hopefully if it, some of these conversations help folks, uh, make better decisions and find, uh, better, better situations where they, they can really stop wasting time, money, energy, and frustration, um, and, and get that freedom and sell the outcome. And, and, uh, yeah. So anyway, definitely sounds like you and I can have a lot more conversations about all this, but again, I want to be respectful of your time and, and folks. And, uh, yeah, uh, again, we have all the, the links to where you are in the show notes, but uh, if you want to say one more time where folks can find you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if people are dealing with hip problems, then uh, hip impingement, femoral acetabular impingement, then the FAI fix is a good place to start. Um, we've also got hundreds of free videos on YouTube. If you search, you know, FAI fix or hip impingement, you'll likely come across us. Or my other website, gotrom.com, is the home to a bunch of other programs about 
fixing injuries and getting flexible. So, you know, things related to neck pain, back pain, um, doing the splits, doing a back bridge, getting deep squats, all of that stuff is housed on gotrom.com. Love it. Love it and love it. And hopefully folks go uh, touch base with Shane in the many platforms he's on, uh, very active on social media, it seems as well. And uh, other than that, enjoy your day in the backwoods of Colombia. <laughs> and uh, everyone else, uh, good. hope you got 1% better today. If you got some benefit out of it, don't forget to share, like, subscribe, leave a rating, review, wherever you're listening to this, watching this, YouTube, all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, we'll talk to you guys next time. 